everyone, and welcome to the Foreign Object Detection on Cheese webinar from Headwall. My name is Marissa Dupont. I am the marketing specialist here. Uh, just an FYI, this webinar is being recorded and should be available for viewing within 48 hours. We will answer as many of your questions live as possible, but additional questions can be answered by email after the conclusion of this webinar. And you can send those to marketing at headwallphotonics.com. All right, so our agenda today, we're going to do an introduction, talk about our related products, hyperspectral machine vision, a feasibility study, and then Q&A via live text chat to panelists, and then we'll wrap up. You can ask questions using the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel on your PC or phone, and you can see uh, the locations for where the questions panel is on each of those. All right, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Mikhail Gibran, who is the Business Development and Sales Manager of Machine Vision in the Americas here at Headwall, Will Rock, who is the Product Manager of Machine Vision, and George Killian, who is the Application Scientist. I'll turn it over to Mikhail. Thanks, Marissa, and thanks to you all for attending today's webinar. I'd like to start by uh, giving a brief introduction into Headwall Photonics. So Headwall has been in business since 2003. It was acquired by Arsenal Capital Partners in 2022. We're headquartered in Bolton, Mass, uh, with two other sites in Fitchburg, uh, Massachusetts, and Marlboro, Mass. Uh, we also have our sister company, Perklas, in the Netherlands. We have over 100 highly skilled employees with all of our engineering, manufacturing, and support based, of our, based out of our headquarters in Bolton. Uh, next slide, please. We recently reorganized our business and split it into three different business units, machine vision, remote sensing, and OEM optical components and assemblies. Our machine vision business is aimed after lab and process applications. We are known to have ready to use standalone scanning packages, which could include different type of hyperspectral camera, stage, lighting, and software, meaning you could start acquiring data from day one. The same is applicable for our remote sensing uh, division. They also have turnkey payload and uh, uh, airborne packages that are ready to use from day one. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Will Rock, who is our product manager for Machine Vision. Thank you very much, Mikhail. I'm going to start by giving everybody a brief introduction to the product line for machine vision uh, from Headwall Photonics. As you can see on the slide in front of you, the three highlighted sensors we have for uh, machine vision are the MVC V-Near, the MVC Near, and the MVX. On the far left is the MVC V-Near, the smallest and lightest V-Near sensor in its class. It provides uh, a spectral range of 400 to 1,000 nanometers and uh, is a USB 3.1 sensor. The middle uh, image is the MVC NEAR, which is a NEAR imaging spectrometer providing a spectral range of 900 to 1700 nanometers uh, that is specially designed for uh, machine vision applications. Uh, and it has a, a very fast full frame rate, as you can see in the bullet points below. And uh, on the far right is the MVX, which is a hyperspectral imaging system. Now, the, this hyperspectral imaging system provides onboard processing that uh, allows direct output of analyzed results, while the components, the MVC VNIR and the MVC NIR, are designed to be connected to a PC uh, and controlled via per-class MIRA. Headwall also has a, uh, a PC that we call the MVPC that's designed to operate with all of these sensors uh, using per-class MIRA for acquisition and control. And as is shown on the next slide, all of these sensors can be coupled with the per-class MIRA stage to, and an MVPC to create uh, an MD scan package. These packages give you everything you need to uh, quickly unbox and set up and start taking hyperspectral imaging scans uh, and, and to go and to do everything, it has everything you need to acquire, um, develop models, and then deploy those models uh, all within one interface without even changing your program. Uh, and so we think that this is a, a, a very attractive new package and the per customer software uh, provides a very intuitive interface to even allow beginners to uh, train on uh, uh, hyperspectral scans and create models very quickly. Um, and 
as I stated, those models can then be deployed all in the same interface as well. Uh, and the stage package comes in a rugged Pelican case uh, that's actually fairly easy to move from place to place. It uh, actually can uh, be checked luggage on an airplane, so uh, it, it's not so hard to travel with. Um, and you can get interpreted scans within a few minutes. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to talk about our website, which was recently redesigned. Uh, and this new website provides uh, a more intuitive interface, and we have uh, uh, restructured how we're presenting our product line and technology. Uh, so you can more easily browse the, the packages and the products that are available from Headwall to, to easily find what you're interested in. Uh, but don't worry, all of our uh, the content that you're used to, our tools like the field of view calculator and all our video demos and tutorials are, are all there. And we're continually working on updating that organization so you can find what you're interested in more quickly. Uh, and you can also find introductions to um, our uh, partner companies or our, uh, like Per Cosmira uh, via the website. So, so please visit our website if you have more questions. Uh, and now I'm going to jump into a uh, brief introduction to hyperspectral machine vision or hyperspectral imaging in general. Uh, so just to lay the groundwork, so uh, for those of you that aren't intimately familiar with hyperspectral imaging, uh, I, I want to quickly explain the technology uh, so you get a, a quick idea of what we're doing and uh, the, the cool stuff that we're enabling through our software and our packages. So hyperspectral imaging is the combination of, as you can see on the left, imaging and in the middle, spectroscopy. Uh, and the result gives you a hyperspectral data cube, as is shown on the far right. Uh, a hyperspectral data cube can be envisioned in a couple of different ways. The, the picture on the far right shows you a stack of hundreds of different colors, which is one way to think of it, where it, as an RGB camera gives you three colors, red, green, and blue. A hyperspectral camera uh, can give you hundreds of bands. Uh, that allows you to have uh, hundreds of different grayscale images that you can use to classify uh, a, your, your product in, in different ways. Uh, the way that I tend to think about it as someone that has, uh, has grown up in spectroscopy labs is uh, as having a full continuous spectrum at every spatial pixel. And this enables the use of spectroscopy analysis techniques uh, to discriminate uh, the, the, the different uh, chemical composition in, in every spatial pixel of your image, uh, providing a very powerful combined technique uh, to give the discrimination of the spectroscopy and the um, full uh, field of view of an image. Um, and as can be seen on the next slide, uh, we just show a, a, an example of how we, we classify uh, an image in hyperspectral imaging. So this example image is six different white powders. The, to the naked eye, these are all just white, but to a, uh, a, a near-infrared hyperspectral image, these white powders are all very different. Uh, and the white powders are uh, table salt, uh, baking soda, glucosamine, ammonium nitrate, uh, sugar, and white clay. And as you can see from the spectral profile of each, they're all very, very different. So if we build a library that contains a uh, spectral profile of each of these different uh, samples or chemicals, uh, we can build a model that compares these library spectrum against every spatial, the spectrum found in every spatial pixel as we are scanning. And uh, as is shown in the example on the far right, when a spatial pixel matches a spectrum from our library, it's given a, a false color. Uh, so the image on the far right uh, shows how we can uh, identify what is in every spatial pixel in the scene. Um, and again, this is, can all be done in real time as we are scanning uh, using the Percos Mirror software. And to show a little bit more about how our sensors work in the type of technology, on the next slide uh, shows a quick example of what push broom imaging looks like. So all of our sensors are push broom hyperspectral imagers, uh, which means they are line scanners. So they're collecting just a sliver of the scene at a time. Uh, this lends them naturally to be used on things like conveyor belts. Uh, you can see on the far left, uh, the blue line there represents the sensor field of view. Uh, so this is the sliver of the scene that is being captured. And, and then as you saw the, the sample moving under that sensor field of view, you saw the image waterfall and the analysis waterfall build up. Um, and so this is just a, a graphic way of showing as the samples passing under the sensor, we're building up an image. 
And as we are building up that image, we're analyzing it at the same time. Uh, so after you develop a model in Perclas Mira, it enables you to deploy that model. And uh, as the sensor is, is scanning, every single spatial pixel as it passes under the sensor is uh, given a class and is being uh, again classified and put into that class. And we are also doing things like object segmentation. So as a full object passes under the sample, we are uh, telling you this is where that object is and uh, allowing you to pass that object information down the line to uh, say a robot that might want to uh, eject or note the, those objects of interest. So uh, this is very powerful push broom imaging technology uh, that enables you to scan and scan uh, full spectral information and analyze it all at once. I like to think of a hyperspectral imager as being hundreds or even over a thousand spectrometers in a single box. So uh, every time you're taking a, a single pixel of your scene, you're not just getting one pixel, you're getting that full spectrum. So uh, again, it's a, uh, to a spectroscopist, it's like having thousands of spectrometers in a box, allowing you uh, to leverage that spectral information to uh, classify your whole scene. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, George, who's going to talk to you about uh, this application of interest. Uh, that is our latest application in a series of webinars that we're doing uh, to help excite everybody about uh, all the really cool things that you can achieve with hyperspectral imaging. Uh, so with that, take it away, George. Thanks, Will. So uh, we uh, hyperspectral imagers can be used to solve lots of different problems. So we need a problem. Well, for this particular application, the problem is that recalls are costly and can certainly damage a brand's reputation. Recently, there have been multiple recalls of tens of thousands of boxes and crates of cheese that have been pulled back due to the fact that plastics and plastic films have been left on cheeses after they've been uh, processed and packaged. So because of the difference in spectral uh, patterns of fit plastic films and cheese, it was hypothesized that hyperspectral imaging would might be able to provide an opportunity to scan and assess a piece of cheese and be able to detect the plastics and films that might be left behind. We partnered with uh, Groba. Groba is the cheese experts as Perclas Mir and Hedwall are the hyperspectral experts. Uh, they make uh, cheese processing equipment and are experts in understanding on how and what types of plastics are left behind on cheeses during the processing and packaging processes. So they provided for us the cheeses and the plastics for this particular uh, feasibility study, and we can't thank them enough for their assistance in being able to provide us those well ground truth samples and being able to create a great feasibility study. So the, the objective of this feasibility study, as I mentioned before, is to be able to detect the different plastics that were left behind on the cheeses. The different types of plastics were of different colors and of different transparencies. And they were placed on the cheeses and the cheeses were scanned with the MVC near hyperspectral imaging sensor and utilized with the per class mirror software. As you can see on the next slide, how the MV scan package that Will mentioned earlier works together. So the MVC near sensor is what you see at the top part of the picture. On the uh, right hand side, you see the MVPC. This is where the data is both gathered, assessed, and then deployed once a model has been created. You see the block of cheese that's been placed on the MV on the per class mirror stage, and it's all works together within the per class mirror software. The per class mirror software, as well mentioned earlier, is beginner friendly. You do not need to be an uh, expert in hyperspectral imaging to be able to take advantage of hyperspectral images to be able to create robust models and be able to deploy those models for real time results. The image that you're seeing on the screen, the screenshot on the right hand side, you see the different mean spectra of the different classes of both the plastics and the cheeses. In the middle, you see a classified image of the cheese where Plastics have been detected and objects have been segmented. These objects are contiguous regions of pixels that have been classified as plastic as opposed to the cheese. And on the far left, you see that there are lots of different images that have been set as both testing and training images, uh, highlighted in uh, green and white respectively. This way that you can add lots of images to a particular per class mirror project to again, build those robust models. 
So what are the results of these uh, of, of these uh, models? Well, first we have to be able to deploy those models. And so we start with well ground truth samples and we collect that training data. We're going to assign pixels that we know to be plastic covered cheese pixels and add them to the plastic class. We're going to add pixels that are known to be cheese pixels and add them to the cheese class. And then we're going to train a model and perfect that model via either trimming the regions of interest from the different wavelengths that we might need. And then we can always deploy that model as well. The instant feedback that you get enables for rapid corrections. So you can quickly assess the model that you have just made, find out what needs to be modified, and then attest in that model repeatedly until you have a model that you find to be uh, quite strong. So as I mentioned, the results of this particular study were very successful. There were 28 plastic objects that were placed on four different pieces of cheese. Uh, the first type of cheese shown in the first and fourth image and the second type of cheese shown in the second and the third image. All 28 pieces of plastic were identified as you can see in the confusion matrix in the right. Uh, for per class Mira, we labeled regions that we knew where the plastic objects were. These are user input regions that we have drawn on the image so that per class mirror can assess whether an object has been successfully detected or not as shown in the uh, confusion matrix. All 28 objects were correctly classified as a foreign object and none of those objects that we drew were not found as uh, plastic objects. So the conclusion of this feasibility study was quite strong. The, the near-infrared hyperspectral imager can non-destructively just dis differentiate between the four objects from the cheese, even if they look similar, whether they be colored plastics, whether they be transparent plastics. And this shows just how well hyperspectral imaging can work where uh, traditional imaging sensors might fail in the past. These uh, also, per class mirror is able to provide the coordinates of these plastic bodies to actuators for object removal in downstream processing. And this is a great solution to avoid those costly product recalls that I mentioned earlier, where tens of thousands of packages of cheese have to be recalled because of plastic that had gone undetected since they did not use hyperspectral imaging. Of course, we're not just uh, able to detect things with cheese. We have lots of different applications that we have shown that hyperspectral imaging and per class mirror can be utilized together to create great models, whether it be in the meat industry to detect plastics, labels, bones, the fish industry to detect netting, seaweed or, seaweed or other foreign objects, uh, in the vegetable and fruit industry to find natural objects like rocks and potatoes and all the wonderful uh, and, and many, many more uh, applications that we have used. So with that, the conclusion of that feasibility study, I'm gonna pass it back over to Will Rock to talk about uh, per class mirror five, which was used in this uh, feasibility study. Thank you very much, George. And uh, as I teased earlier, uh, there is an update coming to the per class mirror software. So very soon, per class mirror 5.0 will be released, and that offers many exciting new features. If you haven't already viewed our webinar that uh, came back or uh, came out a few weeks ago, uh, plugging the release of per class mirror five, please visit our website and uh, view that webinar. Uh, it, it highlights the, the features that are mentioned here that uh, it enables a more efficient acquisition workflow. It allows uh, developers to use two cameras simultaneously. Um, this enables uh, Headwall to offer a dual camera scanning MV scan package uh, for uh, those developers that want to test whether a V-near sensor or a near sensor is the right solution. And it even offers uh, a built-in operator mode that uh, allows uh, within the same software package a, a developer or an engineer to make models and then uh, switch it to operator mode and pass it off to a technician uh, for deployment and, and use at line or uh, in the field. And there are also uh, even more applications uh, that are highlighted in uh, the webinar. So please view the webinar if you haven't already uh, and, and visit our websites at perclass.com or headwealthatomics.com. And now I'm going to pass it off to Mikhail, uh, where he is going to highlight some of the events that Headwall is going to be at in the near future. Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, I just uh, want to let everyone know that uh, at the end of this month, we'll be at Photonics West in San Francisco, followed by Fruit Logistica at the beginning of February in Berlin. 
uh, please uh, go ahead, find us and stop by our booth. Uh, we will be there along with our sister companies, uh, especially per class. Uh, we will have our hyperspectral scanning systems on display. So please stop by and ask us questions. Next slide, please. And now we go back to Melissa for Q&A. Hi, everyone. So um, just again, uh, on your screen, you'll see how to ask questions in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and oh, hold on, we'll get started. All right, so first question, can your method work through existing plastic wrap? Uh, yeah, I, yeah I can take that question. So, um, of course, it depends on the type of plastic uh, and depends upon the unique uh, features of your product itself. Uh, if this were, uh, if the importance of any model that's being created is, of course, based off of the ground truth samples that are being provided for that model. So, being able to provide within Per Class Mira images that have plastic wrap that you would like to uh, keep or you'd like to that are successfully being packaged and then samples that have been uh, that have been inappropriately packaged or that have been some defects on that as well. Okay. Have you tried this experiment with any cheese that has embedded substances like spices or herbs or meat? Um, so I'll take that. So um, this particular feasibility study was done just on the two types of cheeses that were shown. Um, I, I do want to note that hyperspectral imaging is a surface technique, so uh, we can't penetrate through the cheese and find something embedded in it. Uh, I believe the question was getting at, though, have we tried it on, say, a, a pepper jack cheese or something that has little pieces in it that would make the background uh, more complicated than just the uniform colored cheeses that were shown? Uh, the answer is no, we haven't tried those different types of cheeses. Um, I would uh, suggest that it probably would still work, although it would be a slightly more complicated model because as you are pointing out, the, uh, the true cheese class would include more things than just the, the uniform color of cheese uh, as was shown in this example here. How big a piece of cheese can be scanned? Uh, there's not really, a, well, <laughs> there's kind of a limit. So how big of a piece of cheese can be scanned? That more depends on how you set up the sensor. Uh, when you're going down to the, the small limit, what's the smallest piece of cheese that can be found? Uh, you would want, uh, say, four or five pixels across in order to make a, uh, a good detection that there's actually a piece of cheese there. And you can visit our field of view calculator on the website uh, to find what the minimum working distance is for our different sensors and uh, lens combinations to see uh, just what the, the smallest pixel size is for um, the, the different sensors. Um, you can also use the field of view calculator for the other way. So what's the biggest piece of cheese you can uh, scan? Well, in general, that's going to be limited by how wide is your belt. Um, so if you have a one foot wide belt, uh, your piece of cheese isn't going to be wider than that one foot. If it's three feet wide, that piece of cheese is going to be three feet wide. And the length of the cheese doesn't really matter to the hyperspectral imager. It will just keep going under the push broom sensor uh, and, and continue uh, to be built up as a larger and larger block of cheese. Um, but uh, of course, the, what you would need to do to get that wider field of view would be to move your sensor higher uh, or employ a wider focal length lens. How do you figure out whether a particular type of sample will produce useful data in near or sphere or other wavelength ranges? Well, the short answer is we don't know, uh, but the longer answer is that we historically know that there have that the plastics have useful fingerprints in the near infrared and the sphere ranges as well. Uh, the near was selected uh, for this particular uh, study because we were able to uh, successfully create that model in that particular region and through a little bit of, 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 uh, of, of effort there. So uh, whenever it comes to starting off with uh, a feasibility study, the first thing we always do is scan in both the V-near, the near, and the SWEAR ranges to find out which uh, range is able to create the most optimal model. And then we move from there when it comes to uh, deploying it on a per-class stage or deploying it for uh, an industrial project. 
And, and I'll just also note that uh, with per class mirror five, that expedites that process, allowing you to use multiple sensors simultaneously. Uh, so you can scan once and uh, test two sensors. Great, will your method work with Swiss cheese with holes? Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, so I guess I would say it, if you put Swiss cheese on a sandwich, it has a hole that goes all the way through. But if you're scanning a block of cheese like we did here, uh, that hole doesn't go all the way through the block of Swiss cheese. Uh, so again, we're, I'll always qualify. We didn't test on Swiss cheese, uh, but Swiss cheese would generally be a, a uniform cheese like we uh, tested here. Uh, so it would likely work quite well. The, the one caveat being those holes would create uh, some shadows. So as long as the holes weren't so deep that it completely shadowed and we weren't able to get any light back to the sensor, uh, it, it should work quite well. Um, whereas if you have uh, deep holes that create dark shadows, uh, and any imaging technique is going to fail because again, you need to get light back to the sensor uh, in order for an imager to uh, work well. Can hyperspectral image imaging detect low cheese quality where a cheaper ingredient was used? Uh, I'll take that one as well. Um, again, I would say likely. Uh, the hard part with that is that you would need uh, the ground truth to, to train it. Uh, so hyperspectral imaging is a, a correlation technique where it, it, it can very powerfully uh, find things and discriminate things, but it needs to be told this is good and this is bad. So if you had a particular counterfeit uh, that you were searching for, where I, I wanna find a, this counterfeit cheese because they're, they're sticking it in a lot and, and they're trying to trick me, uh, then you could, and you had samples of that, you could create a class uh, that is counterfeit or low quality cheese, um, and, and include that in your class. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, so as we've done here, this is uh, titled a foreign object detection model. So we've trained the particular type of cheese quite carefully to recognize this is cheese and this is background and anything else is foreign material. Um, and so in that foreign material class, we've included things that are uh, quite close to the cheese that we're scanning. And that includes uh, a transparent plastic on top of the cheese. Uh, and, and so again, without testing, I can't know definitively, but there's a chance that if you put a different type of cheese uh, on your belt, it would be flagged as a foreign object completely. Um, so I, I think that would be a very uh, neat application to test. Um, and, and I have a, a decent level of confidence that it would work. But again, without the tests, I can't definitively say. Yeah, and if I, if I could add, I, we would encourage you to talk to George and Will perhaps you could send us some samples for a feasibility test to figure that one out. I mean, that would be the only way to figure out whether it's doable or not. Can your method detect embedded pieces? What if I can shine a light through the cheese? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one again. In, in general, uh, in, no, we cannot detect, detect embedded pieces. I would say with the caveat, if you're able to shine a bright light completely through the trees and uh, use hyperspectral imaging and what we would call the transmission method, then it would be able to work like that. Um, for the blocks of cheese that we used here, there was no light that was going to get through uh, a, a yellow piece of cheese that's this thick. Um, but if you had a thinner piece of cheese or, or um, again, some other light in the spectral range of interest that our sensors work in uh, and were to shine it through the cheese, you would be able to uh, detect things. Um, I, I would also say that, um, again, not to get too far in front of ourselves, if you're able to shine a light completely through the cheese, uh, to be able to look for foreign material, you might be able to just use a, a normal RGB sensor to find it at that point, uh, where we are at Hebel very interested in finding applications that require hyperspectral imaging. Um, and it, unless your foreign material that's in there is very similar to the cheese, uh, like this transparent plastic, uh, you might be just fine seeing a, a, a dark object in the middle uh, of your, your block of cheese, in which case you could use an RGB sensor. 
Uh, based on my understanding, current near-infrared hyperspectral cameras require tungsten lamps, which operate at high temperatures and do not have as long a lifespan as LED light sources. On an actual production line, would these high temperature lamps affect the quality of cheese? Would the light sources need to be replaced frequently? Uh, I'll take that. And uh, it, so, yes, the standard light is a quartz tungsten halogen lamp, uh, which provides a, a black body light spectrum that gives you light, um, uh, again, across your full spectral range of interest. Uh, and uh, although there are LEDs um, uh, being worked on right now in the near spectral range, uh, they're not the gold standard to date. Um, I, I'll also say that um, the, uh, the QTH lights that we use are uh, line lights, and so they only focus the light where they're needed. Um, and so if you're having a process line that's moving pretty fast, you're really not gonna heat up your cheese at all because there's only going to be a line of light on that cheese um, for uh, milliseconds. Uh, and so you don't worry about heat damage in any way at all on the cheese. Uh, and um, although it won't have the lifetimes that some of the, the more advanced LEDs have, especially LEDs that are designed for RGB, where uh, you have them in your house and things, but those LEDs won't work either. You need hyperspectral LEDs, uh, even in the veneer, because you need the full spectral range. You, in order to take advantage of all the spectral bands, you need to have light in all the spectral bands. Um, but particularly for the near, our sensors um, are actually quite sensitive, and we can usually run the lights uh, slightly dimmer than they're designed for, extending their lifetime uh, to uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours. We've had uh, some of our QTH lights last over a thousand hours. Uh, granted, it depends on your application and how hard you need to drive that light. Um, uh, but again, that the heating isn't a problem. And uh, although you need to change the light slightly more often, um, it, you can still get uh, a fairly long lifetime out of available QTH sources. Okay, final question for everyone. Uh, what is your favorite cheese? <laughs> oh, I, I, the stinkier the better for me. Uh, I, I love a, a blue cheese or a good German cheese that's uh, <laughs> nice and smelly. I'm a fan of brie, a nice baked brie. Thanks. Same here, same here, like George. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oops. I'm moving too fast here. My mouse is so sensitive. Okay, so um, thank you all for attending our webinar today. Uh, we would be excited to work with a motivated partner to develop a real-time foreign object detector for cheese, and you can email us at marketing at headwellphotonics.com or visit us online at headwellphotonics.com and click contact us. Thank you so much for attending, and we'd like to give special thanks to our uh, panelists, Mikhail Gibran, Will Rock, and George Killian, as well as Leah Boutril and Dr. Pavel Paklik from Per Class. And again, uh, contact information is there. Thank you so much for attending. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.